Hello and welcome to episode 97 part 2 of Awesome Astronomy for July 2020. We live in an age of bountiful knowing, a golden age of exploration in a society that has never had such easy and open access to knowledge. Look at the power you hold in your hand. No human in all the history before you can command such individual educational power. We can ask, find and know in an instant. But we're like a chimpanzee handed a power drill. Humanity knows this is a thing. It knows that it's important, but it's damned if it knows what the hell to do with it, and in all likeness it will drill its brains out in a fit of misplaced curiosity. The saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom, as Isaac Asimov said so succinctly. He also beautifully described the current world we now find ourselves in with TRS-80-like accuracy. Anti-intellectualism, he said has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. And thus, we inhabit a world of self-landing rockets, genetic engineering and nuclear physicists, while also inhabiting a world of people who think that 5G will melt their brains, that gender is a solidly unyielding binary, and that evolution will strip them of their morality. And both sides are presented as equal and valid. All views must be respected. And if they're told their view is not, then they scream cancel culture and freedom of speech in the faces of those who are tired of their wrong, unevidenced, bigoted bollocks. They whip up the masses in an attempt to enforce a self-appointed right to say what the hell they like. Real people be damned, for they are a published author and are therefore all-knowing and right. <laughs> We've reached a point where writing children's fiction or appearing on your own YouTube channel also qualifies you as a moral and scientific authority. Celebrity, anti-intellectualism and populism have collided in a perfect storm delivered through the internet in your hand like a plugged-in power tool we barely understand. But we will have no anti-intellectualism here for this is a bastion of reason and evidence. It is also a bastion of barely evolved power tool wielding apes as I introduce my co-hosts Jenny, Cooey and Ralph. I think, therefore, I feel the need to bore people on Twitter. <laughs> Absolutely. I like that. That was a great introduction. Did you like that? That was really good and very prescient. Uh, well, do you know what? I, I, I was saying to you before the show, I, I'd actually written two intros to the show because lots of people accused me of being a little bit a little bit depressing. Hmm. And that was that was nicely balanced. What a, what a great Did species you... we are, but my God, don't we uh, undervalue it. I always like to think about, you know, if you'd given someone like Einstein, like, a mobile phone, you know, it would completely blow his mind. And I wonder sort of what other things would he have been able to do, you know, had he had sort of such easy access to knowledge? Or would he do like we all do and just look at cat memes all day? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I, you know, he I wonder if it it would still boil down to the same thing. You know, if you gave it to any any of the great sort of philosophical any of the great knowledgeable people of the sort of past century you know not not any earlier than that otherwise they completely flipped their lid right at, at what we were handing them at least mm -hmm. you know the past century they know about electricity and stuff right um yeah. and and we'd post stupid things i mean it, it, what what i always think is that some of these sort of great people like einstein and things like that actually if you did meet them now you would probably find them quite abhorrent a lot of the time Mm. Yeah, because because their their views, which will be very much cemented in the time, and that's not to say you know they they weren't nice people and things like that, and they, but actually a lot of their views and their you think of your you think of your grandparents and your great grandparents if you ever met them you know you think oh god granddad's at it again you know he's he said it again yeah. um, and you know, oh bless you know he's he's a person of the time well you think someone like Einstein's a person of the time even before that mm. oh yeah um, I'd be sad and, to go and make the tea I would. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and you think some of some of these, you know, he's a late Victorian in in from from some sort of British point of view. Is is you think some of the attitudes and views, even for someone who's quite liberal and and would would be like, Arr! um, and you think if you gave them Twitter, oh God, it'd be carnage. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't do to know what what your heroes are thinking or, or what beliefs they have. And no. I think that's probably one of the issues of the time: the fact that everyone has to spill out their feelings on everything from politics to religion. That always used to be something that people just kept to themselves. And funnily enough. People People used to get on with each other a lot better. Do you know, I've really been staying away from Twitter recently. Like, I've just kind of been hopping on and off very, very, very sporadically. Um, and I yeah. just kind of, like, 
you know, the past few days I've been like, oh, I'm going to, you know, try it out again, see how the shoe fits, what's, what's occurring and all that. And it is just a torrent of anger mm. about well, that's everything. That's what it's designed for. Yeah. I know, and yeah. it just makes me so sad because, you know, there's some great things. Like, I've noticed at the minute that people are posting loads and loads of pictures of, like, Comet Neowise. Mm. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is great, this is great, this is great. And then, you know, like, a few posts down, they'll just be, like, all this, you know, rightly so, people are venting their anger about all the horrible things that are happening at the minute. But it's just, yeah. 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 No, I've, I've done the same. I've, I've, I've dipped out of Twitter and then I've come back a little bit with the whole Neowise thing but I've, I'm just mm. avoiding news and politics completely at the moment I'm, well I'm uh, if I could just news. draw your attention just... to the fact that comets are well known racists and that means that anybody that <laughs> enjoys comets is a Nazi <laughs> uh, probably probably there'll, there'll, there'll be an angle there'll be an angle <laughs> like that definitely definitely it's probably a leftist conspiracy probably <laughs> and 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 Darren Grimes will do a whole YouTube interview with, with some old historian who'll Sort of accuse everyone of being sort of in in a conspiracy with the Jews or something. It was Comet Neowise that brought uh, COVID nineteen to us. So just putting that out there because via five G, probably, probably. Yeah, yeah. It, it dropped it off as it was going towards the sun, and now it's leaving the solar system. It's yeah, it's it's all Comet Neowise's fault. Oh, look, yeah, look, I, no, 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 look, I need the other intro. I need the other intro now. You <laughs> look, look, you, you, you need. I, I was going to say, look, listen, kittens, puppies, kittens and puppies. <laughs> a basket of kittens and puppies. A basket of kittens and puppies licking your face. Well, <laughs> well, you say that, Paul, but uh, Fidel Castro liked kittens and puppies, so I'm just going to say communist. Oh, you see, look, you see, I can't. You just you know, that that was that was the opening to my my alternative intro <laughs> that was that like, kind of nice and cuddly. And my cat did a sh in my housemate's room the other day. So <laughs> <laughs> magnificent. <laughs> so, so Paul, can we pretend the last two minutes never happened and talk about your CPD courses? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back working with the European Space Agency and the uh, European Space Education Resource Office um, and delivering teach training. Um, they wanted a, a whole series of teaching, and we we've changed now. We're no longer space ambassadors, as I was. No more Ferrero Rocher. Mm. We're now space champions. I, 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 I preferred ambassadors. I, I like you know that. what? I'd, without besmirching my my current um, sort of employers, I I did prefer ambassador. It sounded more. I, it had a gravitas. Well, people don't I call thought. you Your Excellency anymore, do they? <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. They, they, they you know, I, I feel like I can't wear the full suit and, and sort of, you know, walk in like a, a British diplomat in, into a school. No more petals so, being thrown at your feet. No, exactly, exactly. So that's, um, I've got a whole series of, of teach training sessions I'm doing from uh, Wednesday. Oh, it's the, actually, this, uh, this Tuesday is the first one. Um, and I'm, I've got, got to see hundreds of teachers before December. Um, teach them all you that space and stuff. You are selling out on these courses as well. Oh, they've sold out. My 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 first four, my first run of four, completely. They, the first one, I put it up on Sunday night last week. It was by the time I woke up the next morning, because teachers work all night. Um, it sold out, and they're free. I mean, they say sold out. They, it's it's free to the, the the people on it. It's hardly surprising they're they're getting filled up then if. I mean, this is professional development points that people can get learning about learning how to present things that are really exciting in the classroom, and they're for free. I mean, that is mm. what's better than that. Yeah, because everyone uh, hates keeping up with their CPD points, but something yeah. that's that's fun like it, this, fantastic stuff. It's exactly. just great that Easter are doing this. It's great. Yeah, they they've been um, it's sort of it, it started I think in lockdown where they decided they they would kind of try and kind of use use the opportunity to, to do it all online as well as I said I haven't even got to go anyway I, when I did the Tim Peake stuff I had to actually go and visit schools and drive around the country doing CPD in schools and things mm. this one I'm doing it from the comfort of my own living room it's brilliant <laughs> um, so yeah that's been good I mean it, it sort of follows on I've been doing workshops and things for schools at home um, mm. it's great I've been doing, doing doing the same work but not having to drive anywhere which has been, it's been quite nice but yeah so that that's the stuff I'm doing for the European Space Agency over the next little while uh, so if you're a teacher get in touch I'll, I'll get you some free CPD. Nice. I was yeah. on the radio so, again. Um, yeah, I say you. I was just about to say you, you've been busy mm, again. I know. This was BBC Radio Bristol, and it was the age-old question. It's honestly one of my favourite questions: is why isn't Pluto a planet anymore? Mm. You know, it's been like mm. fourteen years, and people are still upset about it. Isn't it bizarre? 
which always amuses yeah. me. I wonder if that's because most people, if they're not nerds like us on on subjects of space, they they've got that question in their head of, well, it was a planet. Now it's not a planet. Why is that? And, and people yeah. don't really care that much about metrology as to you know why why something would be designated something and what criteria it has to fulfil. And I guess that's uh, it, know- really, isn't it? Do you know why I think people are obsessed with this? Because I think when it happens, there wasn't really a lot of explanation as to why it happened. It just did. I also don't think people quite understand why. Yeah. But it also does seem a little bit arbitrary. I mean, we know it's not, but it yeah. does seem like, okay, we are changing the, the categorizations, and, uh, well, rather we're bringing in a, a set of categories, and uh, and that means that Pluto will no longer be a planet, and it's all very dry. Well, well, why on Earth, International Astronomical Union, are you saying this is no longer a planet and, and changing all the mm. definitions of what a planet is? So I can see why some people are aggrieved. They, I don't think the messaging was that good to start with. No, but also I think there is a little element of that, um, oh, things were better in my day kind of <laughs> atmosphere that is, you know, these, these got a bloody T-shirt. Oh, there were nine planets when I was young. It's like, oh, God, I don't care. Oh, I ate that. Do you remember 2005, though? <laughs> I think things were better in our day. Yeah, it should be fair. <laughs> this, uh, right now? Yeah, true. It was 2006. So, like, I grew up with nine planets in the solar system. You know, like all my childhood space mm. books, like I've still got a bunch of them, and it's it's quite amusing going back through them because they're like, oh, Jupiter's got thirty nine moons, and I'm like, mm-hmm. Heck no. <laughs> but do you know what? When I grew up, when I grew up, there were only twelve moons of Jupiter when wow. I was at school. I should get a really? t-shirt with that on because that, and I, I should basically reject all the other moons. I reckon yes, on that should. basis, yeah, <laughs> shun them at the very least. Any that anything that's happened since I was at school is bollocks which is mm. basically <laughs> an attitude that exists today yeah um, hey, it's a, it's a definition and a criterion that is just as valid as any other oh let's let's go back to what what things were like when paul was a day and see whether this actually is an exoplanet or not no actually actually you'll think you'll find there are no exoplanets yeah i refer you back to my introduction it's that it's that kind of the bo- world we inhabit that people still kind of hold on to that as like, well if, if i didn't learn it at school you know then, then it's nonsense mm. if it's happened it's happened since i i i left um dunce's high in in 1963 then it, it's not valid there were no smartphones um, or internet when i was a boy so there shall be none now <laughs> <laughs> oh we didn't have calculators in my day we just had a big book with all the calculations that are in the calculator in and if it was good enough for you paul it's good enough for everybody no, I, I had a calculator. I was in secondary school when, like, the first touchscreen phones started coming out. Oh, God, do I feel old? <laughs> that was, uh, that was, oh, everyone was obsessed with us. But you know when the first touchscreen phones came out and they were properly shit? Yeah, I was at work. Yes. They just, like, didn't, they were, you, you were, like, bashing the thing with the little pen that it came with because it didn't work with your finger. You had to, like, use the pen to get it to work. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that was the big technological revelation, I think. Oh, and also YouTube. I think YouTube was invented when I was in secondary school. Jeez. Oh, yeah. jeez. Yeah, because that was like 2005. Do you know, I remember the innovation that was a very long phone cable, so you could actually pick the phone up off the phone table and go into another room. Yeah. And <laughs> shut the door. So you you could have a private conversation with your friends on the phone without your parents listening. Hot damn. I remember the remote control having a cable to the television. Shut up. That was never a thing. It was. <laughs> It no, was it wasn't. Absolutely bloody a thing. <laughs> Shut the I front re- door. Your remote was not attached to your bloody TV. Hey, it's still Is remote. Are you serious? Yeah. That's bloody serious. In fact, I remember the telly that didn't have the remote and had big chunky buttons on the front that said BBC One, BBC Two, ITV. And you went you had to walk over to telly and push the button. And God, it changed you two the are channel. old. <laughs> didn't you just get a stick, like a really long stick, so you could you know, poke it from where you were sat? Somebody must have done. done with a rubber on the end. Yeah. Well like while I grew up in a council house, it wasn't that small. <laughs> <laughs> the little, like, po- like a pool cue or something. <laughs> Poke it. That's what I was then. Like straight through the screen. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> and they, they were s- chunky screens back then. Right. Anyway, comment here, wise. This is like news before news, isn't it? Yeah, this is like pre-news, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm kind of roping it all into the into the comms that are around at the moment with emails and tweets mm. and all sorts of things because we've, we've kind of hinted on this quite a bit already and alluded to it, but thankfully after all the, the false dawns that we've had and all these hopeful promises around, we finally have a naked eye visible comet in the night sky. I know, it's so exciting. Oh. I'm hoping uh, to have a look at it It's tonight. so exciting. 
That's my plan. I bet to go see it tonight. Yeah. That's bad show prep, Jen. You should have checked it out last night, ready for the show. There's been two, two clear nights where it's I been know. visible and you haven't seen it. No, I know. <laughs> And, and I know that talking about the comet is uh, more appropriate for the astronomy show, but it won't hang around in the sky for long. So we're bumping this up yeah. to this show to give you a heads up to, to go out there and take a look for yourself. Um, you want to be mm. looking around about 12 degrees above the northeast horizon, about 3 a.m. in the mornings. That's the best time. But it is circumpolar, so you can pretty much see it as soon as it's dark if you've got a low north northwesterly horizon. Um, and it just kind of just moves slightly towards the north as the night gets on. It starts dipping towards midnight and then rising again. Um, but it never actually goes below the horizon. So kind of 11 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the Northern Hemisphere is about the perfect times to, to go and take a look. Um, and if you've been looking on... Twitter and Facebook, there's just so many wonderful uh, oh. images of this. And uh, this is actually a cherry popped for the show because we've not had a Naked Eye comet in the skies since this show started in 2012. Uh, I remember no. Comet Garrod um, nearly became visible in early 2012, um, but you still need right. binoculars or a camera to pick that out. We had Pan Stars, uh, I think that was about 2013, but that was, you needed binoculars for that. Um, yeah, well, Pan Stars. I remember. Well, funny enough, I was talking because my wife has been very excited about the comet. Actually, I've been actually getting getting. She's been taking images and things like that. She's been been up late watch, looking at the comet, mm. and she said, "Oh, I remember there was a comet you dragged me out to have a look at years ago." Yeah. And I said it was Pan Stars, and it just got on the cusp of naked eye. Did it? I'm pretty it was sure just there. Pan Stars yeah, coincided was, with one of the astro camps. No, I, th I think it, I think it was. It was. Because I was I was here in Wiltshire and we were already doing Astro Camp then, but I can't remember if it was or not. But certainly, I remember it was one. It was Pansars just on the. It was about must have been like five six magnitude. Mm. It was just visible if you knew where it was and it was a dark sky. But it was nothing like this. Yeah, I mean, basically, what we've got now is something that you won't you won't be having this kind of conversation in ten years' time and going was that was that the one that was naked eye or not? I mean, we definitely yeah. have one that is yeah. naked eye. You can pick it out in the sky. Um, if you know where to look, because it's quite, quite, it's like a faint star, but then you can see the uh, the tail extending from it, pointing kind of diagonally yeah. upwards. And uh, we've already seen some fantastic images um, from Britain, the US, Spain, Canada, Brazil, pretty much anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. And some of our listeners here have been contacting us with their experiences and images too. So our, mm. our good friend Lisa Howley in Oklahoma emailed us saying she was looking for it naked eye last week and saw it low on the horizon as a fuzzy star with a bit of a diagonal streak, which is exactly what it will look like in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, Rick Anderson in Dundee was able to clearly see it between the clouds with binoculars around 3 a.m. in the morning and sent us a very fine sketch. And actually, uh, Paul's been doing some wonderful sketching as well. We've mm. had quite a few sketches that... Um, that have been, we've been tagged into on Twitter. So I've been retweeting those because it's kind of a bit of a lost art. Um, Peter Coates, uh, not that Peter Coates, bagged some very nice images. Um, while our good friend Steve Brown managed to bag the whole experience with naked eye, binocular and telescope views, sketches and photography. So he's got the, uh, well, I was going to say the, the uh, Holy Trinity, but, it, but what's five? One, two, three, four. Yeah, what's five? Holy... Quad. No, quad quin is for quint. Quint. Quin quint. Quin quintery. <laughs> I don't know. Quintarchy. Quint I don't know. He's Bye. such a show off that Steve Brown. He's even he's he's he's, he's it's a typical Yorkshireman. Typical Yorkshireman. Can't be outdone. Typical Yorkshireman. They, they just they can't they can't just do do a couple of things. He yeah. has to do the whole thing, doesn't he? Yeah. Holy Pentagon. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Pentagon, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're listening to this on the 15th or 16th of June when the when the show comes out, assuming it hasn't significant, or, or even July, or even July, <laughs> <laughs> and we're hoping it won't have dimmed because it is it's it's gone past perihelion, its closest point to the sun, where it will be at its brightest mm. and where it's at the greatest risk of breaking up, which thankfully it hasn't. But it is actually mm. getting closer to us, so we're in that kind of trade-off point of it getting slightly yeah. dimmer but getting slightly closer as well. So it should stay bright up, at least up until the 23rd which of July which is going to be the um the point when it's closest to us and it's actually rising higher in the sky as well so it's um mm. it's it's a great time to go and watch it you want to be uh looking uh, before sunrise um each night above the northwest horizon um uh, before it starts to drop in the sky again and if you're interested to know why it's called neowise a bit like pan stars actually um neowise is a project that uses data from nasa's wide field infrared survey explorer telescope to look for asteroids because 
asteroid and moving object searchers often also find comets and that means they can put their name to them um, a bit like the, the panstars comets um, that's using the panstars equipment and telescope uh, looking for for near-earth asteroids so there's a lot of comets named panstars as well and i would just remind you of something we said in the sky guide um last episode mm. that was also comet lemon yes which is about to 2019 U6 Lemon, yeah. and they they they're both going to be in Coma Berenices at the same time in about the last week of July. Yes, they're they're almost going to pass over, aren't they? They won't they won't cross yeah, each other, but so they'll be in the same constellation, hitting it from different directions. You should get a nice binocular view and things like that. They potentially, I've not looked at Lemon yet, and I've not heard much about it. I think everyone's so neo wise focused, <laughs> but especially especially for people with scopes um i think lemon's gonna be a lot dimmer but you will have two two comets right next to each other but i uh, neo wise has just been it's i was saying to uh, uh rob rob tilsey who was on on twitter it's like it's a proper comet it's that comet that looks like all those engravings from you know sort of george and victorian era yeah you know when you see those mm. those fantastic yeah. like the big streak across the sky and everything it yeah. looks like that it actually is a proper comet yeah and the is. first proper one i've i've seen since hail bop yeah, I mean it's a beautiful tail as well. It's kind of it kind of mm. like splits away, and then you've got your eye and tail off to one side as well. It's yeah. it is yeah. an absolutely beautiful comet. This is like the only naked eye comet that I can recall. When was Halley Bop? Because I don't know whether I was alive or if I was very young. Ninety seven was it? Hell Bop was ninety seven. The Great Comet of ninety seven, mm. as it's yeah, called. Yeah. Okay, so I was I was young. I was only only a wee baby. That was my second year at oh. university, and I don't oh. remember. Yeah, it, I say I was at university. I, I, I looked at Neowise over our halls of residence. It was there in the middle of Birmingham. Neowise, there it was. really? Did you mean Halliburton? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was, uh, yeah, I had such vision then. Um, eyes at Seco. Um, no, uh, the the Hale Bop. There Hale it was. Bop. Just you know, even in the glare, because that that was. I mean, Neowise is amazing, but Hale Bop was that kind of once a century comet. It was. Incredible. So here's a question for you: Was Hale Bop in the sky at the same time that Mbop was in the charts? <laughs> Mbop. Um. <laughs> I'm googling that now. One, one final thing on this comet: How fast is data and the transmission of information these days that the port end of a big pandemic comes after the pandemic? <laughs> Wait, what? What year did you say Hale Bop was? Ninety-seven. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was the same year. <laughs> Good old Hanson. <laughs> yeah. So, so what we're saying is that comet was actually the uh, came to warn us of Hanson. <laughs> <laughs> did Hanson come first, or did? <laughs> Maybe they arrived on the comet. Yes. It wasn't actually a comet. It was oh. actually a spaceship. That is a song ahead of its time. It is still a very good song. Well, that is actually the big conspiracy about Hell Bop at the time. Right. Anyway, enough of this neo-wise nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Time for the news. So in an infinite universe, all things are possible, but I will say now that I doubt a world exists where we can stick to time, as already proved, the script, <laughs> or the agreed number of news stories. So, Ralph, what are you going to blow our timing away with this episode <laughs> no i know i'm gonna i'm gonna really stick on point this time. I'm, I'm already off <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna give some artemis updates because um in in normal times artemis updates would have been the big news story once a month but there's so many that's coming out that we're not even going to cover that as a big news story but first up we've got um showing that the monthly updates we've had on this show are all leading to something rather than just being research and press releases uh, at NASA to get people to the moon. Uh, the rocket booster segments for NASA's SLS rocket have arrived at the Kennedy Space Center in mm. Florida for launch, uh, launch preparations in the big vehicle assembly buildings. These will provide the thrust for next year's Artemis flight test mission around the moon. And at the same time, NASA have begun funding the components for six more SLS moon rockets. Uh, NASA already have the rockets lined up for Artemis 1 to fly uncrewed around the moon next year. Artemis 2, the first crewed mission around the moon scheduled for 2023. Artemis 3, which may be the first moon landing in 2024, or rather the the first next moon landing if that makes sense <laughs> and then also a flight to launch the Europa Clipper into orbit around Jupiter which is going to be such an exciting mm -hmm. mission oh, yeah. 
Yeah. So beginning the funding for six more SLS moon rockets is a really big commitment to more missions, especially when it's mm. becoming abundantly clear, even at this early stage, that the Orion and SLS may not be the best or cheapest option to get to the moon by the time the first mission goes next year. Mm. Um, next up, NASA have given Astrobiotic, um, a company in the US, $200 million to build the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, Good to go to the moon's south mm. pole in late 2023. The Viper Rover's 100 Earth Day mission will see it roam in several miles with a drill to bore three feet into the lunar surface. Um, and the Viper Rover will be mainly scouting to find the best sites for future explorers. It'll identify the locations and concentrations of ice to help create the first water resource maps of the moon. This will inform Artemis mission planners when they choose uh, locations to land or set up base near water and other resources that can be harvested to allow extended human expeditions. But its science investigations will also um, provide more insights into the evolution of the moon and the Earth-Moon system. So quite a nice mission and hugely pathfinding for Project Artemis. Uh, NASA has finalised the contract for the initial crew module of the agency's Gateway Lunar Orbiting Outpost. Just, I mean, all this coming in one month is just phenomenal it's nuts um then we have uh, orbital science corporation part of northrop grumman space who are going to design the habitation and logistics outpost for the lunar gateway uh, the moon orbiting space station that forms part of project artemis's sustainable presence at the moon plans uh, this module will be the pressurized living quarters where the astronauts are going to spend their time mm -hmm. while visiting the gateway and it'll be about the size of a small studio apartment so quite a bit bigger than i was expecting that's not bad mm. it's yeah i mean basically it's a space station orbiting the moon and yeah it's going to be quite quite sizable as well uh, Northrop Grumman are expected to integrate the habitation module with the Gateway's power and propulsion element by the end of 2023 for the scheduled launch together in 2024. The power and propulsion element uses solar electric propulsion to, as you'd expect, provide power and communications. And while Apollo could only land in the equatorial regions, this will allow the Gateway to change orbits and let crews land at any part of the Moon's surface so they can cover any, well, land anywhere they want on the Moon. And this is going to be particularly relevant to landing at the South Pole where we, we know that there's a lot of water ice anyway. I've got a quick question. Yeah. So when they do the first landing in 2024, are they yep. planning to use the Lunar Gateway as a stop-off point then? Or are they just going to kind of do a more Apollo-style go to the Moon, explore... Come back. The latter. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the Lunar Gateway originally was going to be in the plans um, to do that, but that's that's had to slip a little bit for, for everything yeah. else to, to fall into place. So that's probably... Say, the modules will go up there, but, I, yeah. but then at the moment it looks like they're not going to be using that for the first uh, landing, but probably for the second landing. Yeah, because I was thinking it's a little bit mm. ambitious to kind of get everything synced up exactly right because yeah. they you know kind of not allowing for any error or for timings to slip or anything okay it's also Carry a on. phenomenal amount of money to keep doing all this architecture as well and nasa's not got a significant amount of extra cash um you know certainly not like mm. apollo era raises in cash it's only a few billion extra which doesn't go a long way in, in this kind mm. of business is it is it going to survive the gateway do you think it might not no, that, well the whole the whole mission on this timetable be given Given current economic strains and an election coming up, mm. and oh, if Kanye gets in, we'll be fine. Well, if Trump wins and wins the election, <laughs> it will definitely go ahead. I think because nobody dare defy him. We say that, but he he loses interest in things quicker than like a three year old kid with a well. I think stick. The, the 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 good thing about this is that he's never really had any interest in this anyway. He's just wanted the glory shot. So it's been a case of right. Mm. This is what I want go off and, and do it and then he's never revisited it again apart from when he could turn up after the spacex flight but uh, so yeah. you know he's not really got involved in it to, to derail it again or, or add any confusion to it so i think if he if he gets another term people will land on the moon 2024 2025 but mm -hmm. um we just don't know if, if the democrats win i reckon if nasa pull the plug on artemis elon musk will pick it up yeah, I think so too, yeah. So, okay, it might not be 2024, but it'll happen. With a lot more inherent risk, though. Yeah, maybe. 
but I think it'll still happen. But I think you're right. Yeah. So finally from me, it's always worth looking at the technology development competitions that NASA launch from time to time because these are to boost innovation in key technology areas that tell us what NASA are looking to do going forward. And the latest round of funding goes to companies developing a compact steriliser for use on spacecraft materials with knock-on benefits for the medical industry and personal protective equipment, low-cost lithium-ion batteries with better performance and longer lifespans, a system to mm -hmm. collect and purify water found on the moon, and high-power solar arrays to provide power on the moon, Mars, and onboard spacecraft. So there's a lot here that's going into in-situ lunar spacecraft on long duration and further destinations like Mars. You know, this is everything is now gearing towards how do we get further out in space and how do we make use of the resources and prevent things from, you know, uh, dust and things clogging up spacesuits and machinery and things like that. So everything now is just full steam ahead towards long duration missions. It's such an exciting time. I can't believe Very all of this exciting. is just a month, just one month's worth of, of news coming out of NASA mm, for Artemis. Mm. Jen. Well, you've actually given me a nice little segue there because you uh, you talked about the moon and then you casually mentioned Mars at the end. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the news because this month, July, we're going to Mars. Yeah. But we're not just heading to Mars once. Oh, no. No, that would be lame. <laughs> there are actually three global missions going to Mars this month. Um, all of them launching to take advantage of the current launch window which is from mid-July through to mid-August. Um, originally, there were going to be four missions to Mars, but unfortunately, ESA's Rosalind Franklin rover has been delayed until the next launch window, which is 26 months away. Mm -hmm. And the gap between launch windows is so long because we have to wait for Earth and Mars to be correctly aligned on their orbits so that we can launch to Mars with the shortest journey time and then also use the least amount of fuel. So first up, we've got uh, one of two nations actually making their first real sort of journey to Mars. Uh, we've got the United Arab Emirates and they're launching Hope mm. Probe. Yeah, it's it's not a country that's ever no. really kind of mentioned in terms of space stuff. The more the merrier. Um, yeah, and so they're planning to launch on like the 15th of July um, and the probe is slated to be like the first weather satellite at Mars. Um, so it's not. There's no rover. There's no lander or anything like that. It's just going to be an orbiter, mm. and it's going to study the atmosphere on a global scale. So it's going to be looking at daily phenomena like dust storms and temperature changes. But then it's also going to be monitoring seasonal variations and then variations in different atmospheric layers, and um, particularly circulation and weather patterns in the middle and lower layers of the Martian atmosphere. And then sort of beyond looking at that. The Hope Probe is going to help us understand the mechanisms driving the atmospheric loss on the Red Planet mm. and how weather variations in the lower atmospheric levels are ties to varying loss rates of like hydrogen and oxygen in the upper atmosphere. Mm. And um, wow. they hope, really, like the UAE, that by studying the current climate on Mars, we're then going to gain understanding of the ancient climate of Mars, which will then help us understand how and why Mars became the dry desert planet that we know of today. Do we not know that already? Well, apparently not. Not really. I mean, we know that... We have our ideas. We know some things, right? We know that, like, obviously all the water was lost. Um, it must have had, like, a thicker atmosphere in the past, which it lost, which is probably because of its small size. But I think they're wondering if there was any kind of, like, chaotic climatic shifts and sort mm -hmm. of try and narrow down the timelines over which things happened. I think that's the plan. Mm. Um very cool. Mm, yeah. Cool. And then, um, Very cool. so the, the orbit is designed to operate for at least one Martian year. Um, and, you know, its goal really is to just give us that first complete picture of the Martian atmosphere. Um, and it's got cameras, so really nice high resolution cameras, actually, um, which means we're going to get some nice images. Mm coming from this mission which is what everyone always wants right yeah. always disappoints yeah. me when they send these missions into deep space and it's like oh just just chuck a hd camera on they just like stick a gopro on like it'll be fine just like <laughs> we want those pictures that's all we want and um 
But it's also got some infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers to kind of, you know, work out what the atmosphere is made of and, and things like that. And there were actual, you know, really serious concerns about being able to launch Hope Probe uh, because of coronavirus. Mm. So the probe is actually launching from Japan. So it had to be shipped there a few weeks ahead of schedule to allow for decontamination. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so this actually means that some of the final checks had to be missed. Oh, oh dear. So yes. they're just accepting some risk on that. Yes, they had to. It was either send it, not having done every check, or don't send it and miss the launch window. Because you've got a, you've got a short a short launch window. You know, you've yeah. got to go in that slot. Yeah. So, but the good thing is, all of the key final checks were performed. It was just like the extra ones that they wanted to do, just to be sh- absolutely sure they weren't performed uh so fingers crossed that the rush to get the probe to japan doesn't have any negative consequences mm. and if the mission is successful it's going to be the first mission to mars of any west asian country which is very impressive actually yeah go west asia mm. yeah and uh the data from hope probe is going to be shared with over 200 institutes worldwide very nice which is very cool. nice. We like that. So the next one is uh, we got China with their Tianwen One mission. So from um, a country that shares its data with other countries to ones that doesn't. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so um, mostly and, borrows other people's. <laughs> and this is this is why I unfortunately I can't give you an exact launch date for Tianwen One because it just hasn't been released. <laughs> It'll be at some point, like the last two weeks released. of July or the first two weeks of August, sort of within the next month as you're listening to this. <laughs> Tiananmen 1 will go up. Um, but actually, uh, Tiananmen 1 is, is very interesting. It's pretty extraordinary, actually, um, for the first mission to Mars to be launched from Chinese soil. So they're, they're actual, you know, technically, their first mission to Mars attempt was like nine years ago. Um, but it that failed on launch. That was Phobos Grunt, wasn't it? Sorry? No, that was Russia's. Yes, but it was a Chinese mission as well, wasn't was it? it? Phobos oh, Grunt. okay. Yeah, yeah and uh, yeah, they, it failed on launch, so... This is like, they're, they're sort of hailing this as the first mission to Mars for China because they're launching it from Chinese soil. So I guess it's technically the first Chinese mission launched from Chinese soil. Anyway, by the by, um, they are doing something which has never been done before for a first mission to Mars. They're going to deploy an orbiter and then also have a lander and a rover. And Ooh. literally, no one has done this. No other nation, when attempting their first Mars launch, has done all three at the same time. Well, apart from America, no one's actually landed on Mars, have they? Well, mm-hmm. yeah, landed. not successfully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, not su- successfully. Europe's landed <laughs> twice. Yeah. successfully is the key um, word there. High velocity landing. Yeah, exactly. So this is, um, this is like, if they can pull this off, it's going to be really immense. Yeah. I think it really will make people kind of sit up and look at China in terms of their space program. Yes, it is. It is very ambitious. Um, and so the goals of Tianwen 1, like most missions to Mars, are to look for evidence of current and past life and then also gain understanding of the general Martian environment. Excellent. So... The orbiter is going to be uh, focusing on exploring the topography of the planet. So it's going to be using medium and high resolution cameras. So again, we've got, you know, another mission that's going to give us some great images. Um, The orbiter's got a spectrometer too and an ion particle analyzer. And both of those are going to be used to study the surface of Mars and also the atmosphere to kind of like figure out what they're made of. Um, also has a magnetometer, so it's going to use that to study Mars's weak magnetic field. And then it also has some ground penetrating radar. But the real, the kind of like the pièce de résistance of this mission is the rover. Um, it's got something really quite interesting. So it's got you know all the standard cameras and the navigational tools and and all that jazz. But it's got a ground penetrating radar system which can right. Are you ready? probe up to a hundred meters down that's amazing which is a significant distance and they're using this to probe for pockets of subsurface water where subterranean life could be thriving now i find this really interesting because it is a completely different approach to kind of the typical method for searching for life on mars which you know it really does kind of focus on the top surface layers like a few inches down that's Mm. it 
Um, but if you think about it, kind of below the surface, microbes are protected from the harsh light of the mm. sun. They're also hidden from the dust storms yep. and like all the violent am- atmospheric changes, right? Now on Earth, we've got these pockets of water that are completely locked off from the surface. But whenever we go and investigate them, they are actually always teeming with life. So this rover, you know, if the whole mission is successful and this rover deploys successfully, it could be a very, very interesting, interesting study. Yeah. And, you know, January, when all of these spacecraft are going to be arriving at Mars, what a what a congested and exciting time that's going to be. I know, right? Mm. I really hope that they're not all going to, like, <laughs> arrive at exactly the same time. We don't really want a traffic jam at Mars, right? Like, you don't... That's what you don't want. Uh, so, yeah. so our news section in January or February is going to be, so this mission failed, this mission failed, and this mission failed. Oh, God, don't. I hope not. <laughs> and for the first time, we have a three-spaceship collision. <laughs> yeah. There's so many of them launching, right, that one of them has to work. The American one will. <laughs> One of them's got to work. But uh, I did say that there was three missions to Mars. I've only talked about two. But the third one is our main news topic. So I'm just going to hand back to Paul now. Yeah, well, our our big story, uh, which is it just follows on, really, doesn't it? Um, It's it's Mars 2020 time, people. It's the big, the big one. Um, And it is a big one because, of course, (laughs) this is... Uh, did you just snigger like a child <laughs> when I say it's a big one? I did. <sighs> anyway, Mars 2020. <laughs> Without your... I'm old enough to remember when we were talking about Mars 2020 as a new story. Um, so, Mars 2020. Now, um, this is this is the big one because it is a... Um, it's Curiosity's sibling, basically. Curiosity is the biggest rover that's ever been sent anywhere. It's huge. Uh, the size of a, a family car and uh, of course nuclear powered um, so you know doesn't require solar panels or anything. it's a really big rover and it's, of course it's landed by the sky crane so as Ralph said earlier this is this is a high chance of success here because this is a rover that is already, essentially already on Mars has already proved itself and the system for landing the sky crane which everyone was very nervous about mm. back in 2012 we know it works, and they've had eight years to to tweak it and look at the data, make it even better. They've changed things like the wheels on uh, the rover, because of course, yes. famously, the Curiosity's wheels are knackered already, and they got they got very tired very quickly. Mm. One little fact about the Curiosity rover's wheels: I don't know if anybody knows this, but um, on the wheels themselves, there's like little holes cut into it for traction. Mm. But yep. those holes are done in Morse code to spell out JPL. No. Yes. I didn't know that. Because NASA do stuff like that. Yeah, it's printing JPL across the surface of Mars. Oh, <laughs> in Morse I love it like that. <laughs> yeah, it's good, isn't it? Oh, it's beautiful. So yeah, I, it's in, but the the wheels got very tired very quickly. Um, actually, within months of it landing, its wheels were already looking like they'd they'd been beaten up, mm. and that's actually been one of the problems of Curiosity is they've they've had to move it quite gingerly at times because they they're worried about the the structure of the wheels and, and keeping them in, as intact as much as possible. So they've redesigned the wheels. They, there's new wheels um, for for this mission, uh, so it's an improvement, and uh, generally it, it is the most incredible bit of kit it's carrying 23 cameras wow holy shit i know isn't it incredible 23 yeah and it's carrying a helicopter <gasps> oh my yes, god i love the helicopter <laughs> i'm which, super excited about which, this well this is it's funny isn't it because in some respects the mission itself is exciting enough and yeah. it's it's um, you know what it's going to do, and it's going to delve into the the, the geological processes and, and, and history of Mars, and it's going to look for past habitability and um, potential for the the sort of basically it's almost like a fossil mission. It's looking as if if there's biosignatures from the past that are still there. Mm. So rather than looking for life now, it's looking for did Mars have life, um, which in a way is probably the most sensible kind of route. It's probably the most likely route. Yeah. Uh, and because there's been lots of hints from Curiosity that potentially you know, this was a planet that had life and could sustain life in in the past, so sending a mission then to actually see if that that is the case is probably 
the kind of sensible option. Mm-hmm. And but the thing that's probably going to steal the limelight is the little helicopter drone that's going to be going with it. Oh, it's so and cool. be sitting on its back. Yeah, I mean, it's um, a- and what's it called? Ingenuity, Ingenuity, isn't it? Ingenuity, yeah. Ingenuity, a little little drone um, that is going to fly, as far as I'm aware, it's going to fly about five times. Yeah, it's going to fly at least once. <laughs> That's yes. the place, like yes. at least once. Yeah. It's, uh, but it, I, I love the concept of this helicopter. Yeah. One... Sorry, I'm going to like totally nerd out now because like I've been reading about <laughs> it and I've just been like, oh my Go God, for it. this is so cool nerd us out with ingenuity go for it so it is literally like a drone in you know with like sort of the four blades and stuff and it's just a technology demonstration um for this mission but the idea is then that they'll use it with future rovers to help the rovers navigate and like find interesting Mm -hmm. things so the idea is is that the um the helicopter gets like you know placed on on the surface of mars and then it like flies off from you know a minute or so it scans the terrain. Um, it kind of goes, ooh, that patch over there is interesting. Goes back to the rover, feeds that information back to the rover, and then it kind of like decides to make its own detour to go and investigate this interesting patch. But also just, how like, to get so there cool. without encountering obstacles. Yeah. It will also be mapping mm, out mm. the safest route for it to travail because you, it takes something, well, probably going to be about 15 minutes to get a signal uh, back and forth from Earth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is what they found out with Curiosity when they started the autonomy process of looking where it's going to go and, and, and being able to decide itself what the best route to go is. But it had to do it yeah. incredibly slowly still. And this is kind of that next step forward of yes. how do you scout where the best places to go are and how to get there safely when you don't, you've got this so much of a time lag between Mars and Earth for commands. Yeah, yeah so it's essentially like another pair of eyes for the rover just just to interject there if you go back to our where we went to the Surrey Space Centre they were in the early days of ExoMars um, looking investigating the idea of reconnaissance rovers weren't they they were they were yeah do you remember that we we interviewed mm. someone who was talking about that yeah that they were going to send some little rovers with ExoMars yeah to, to basically scout ahead they were almost disposable that they would they would be kind of would scout out the route um, so this is a very similar idea but probably better yeah and if you yeah. think about the advances in technology since 2012 when Curiosity went up or 2014 mm. I'm guessing when we went to Surrey Space Centre you know mm. the advances in uh, autonomy in robotics in AI and machine learning it's just we've just got to that threshold now and in signal yeah. processing and processing power that we can really really do fantastic things in autonomy now that we could never have dreamt of 10 years ago mm. when curiosity mm. launched yeah it is it is just this next level of like ai machine learning sort of vibe that is all the range right now and I just think it's so cool that they're going to have this little mm-hmm. helicopter, which will... I mean, well, it won't work for this mission because it's just a technology demonstration to prove that the helicopter like does actually work. Uh, I tell you what, though, it looks like it looks really flimsy. <laughs> like, it is. Because it is like, though, literally it? a it's, tiny, it's tiny, you know, little cube with four legs, which are like literally sticks with ping pong balls on the end of them. Yeah. But that's <laughs> all that's then, needed, like, though, isn't it? We don't need a predator drone because you, no, you know no. you don't need a massive platform. You just need your sensors and your communication links, and then your your, your power supply. And it it wouldn't work anyway because Mars's atmosphere will not support no very heavy craft. It's got no. to have so a it has massive, to be really to really be long wingspan rotors, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, but what's, the, what's the, I mean, the, the biggest thing is this is going to be the first aircraft ever flown on another world. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> and um, that's that's going to be really cool. That that's yeah. going to be your pub quiz question for the future. What was the first aircraft yeah. flown on another world? And it's it's going to be the ingenuity. And if I can project. just wet your appetite a little more. I think was it twenty three cameras you said are on yeah. board Curiosity Gen. It wasn't um, me. It was Paul. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Um, I did. Yep. Yeah. Let me just also add, if uh, if our listeners weren't aware, that you, if you remember how excited you got about the Sky Crane in 2012 and um, and watching all those animations and, and seeing people get excited at JPL when it actually did land, this time, cameras on the Sky Crane, you're going to watch it landing. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All crashing. One, of, one, or two, yeah. one or the other. Oh, so you're that's not going to be, be awesome. Sat- I, I remember sitting there with a laptop watching Mission Control, mm. doing the uh, doing all the commentary and all that kind of stuff. This time, 
you're gonna be watching it. Oh my yeah. God. Oh. <laughs> I, I was at the official um, landing sort of party in the UK for that at the, the Natural History Museum, and the wait, the 14 minute wait. Yeah. Because mm. you knew at that point it had either gone splat oh. or it had landed successfully, but you've got to wait 15 minutes for the signal to it's get like back. Yeah. Schrodinger's rover, right? It has survived and it hasn't. Oh, it was a room full of all these people. This, this sort of like in, in the, the natural history, music, and, and nobody spoke almost for 14 minutes. The Ooh. tension mm. was just incredible. And then the first picture just came through to show it on the surface. And it was like, whoa! Yes! Yeah. It was a huge cheer went up. But this is going to be exciting. Now, the, the one fly in the ointment, of course, is the launch has already slipped. Yes. Okay. Mm. So, and it, it already had, and it was going to be the 22nd of July. It's now slipped to the 30th of July. Yeah. And, of course, the window is only middle of July to the middle of August. So they've, already they've, we've... They've extended the window, moved, haven't they? A little bit, yeah. There, there is, there is a little days. bit. Of, yeah, but it's not much more flexibility than that. that that's yeah. it. But mm. it, it does mean that we're we're essentially already slipped a halfway through the the window. Yeah. So but in the way things have been going, they, every time they change the launch day, they've then got to recalculate. You know the amount of fuel and all this. Sort there's of all stuff. sorts of little. Change yeah, again. exactly. Mm. Yeah, planets and things are moving very, very rapidly. But if they, um, if they and, miss this window, they've got to wait 26 months again for the next one. The yeah, technology yeah. will be two years older than it already mm-hmm. is now. It'll cost yep. another half a billion pounds to, to keep yep. it for that period with technology that's starting to get a little bit old as well. And mm. uh, yeah. America doesn't want to do that. They'll make sure it launches. I'm sure. I'm sure it's going to launch. America's got a good track record of doing this and not delaying these sorts of things. But Europe delays it a launch window. America, will. yeah. The Rosin Franklin was different in that. Really, this is you know, it'll be Europe's first big rover that they've sent. Yeah. Whereas yeah. this is this is this is something you know the Americans have done several times now, and they've even old hat, isn't it? They've already done it with this rover essentially. So it will go, but it, it is it is that little bit of tension, it's that bit of Hollywood tension already. They, mm. they, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. To make the uh, make the film better, exactly, exactly. Right. Well, there we are. That's Mars twenty twenty. Enjoy. If I've seen further, it is from standing on the shoulders of giants. My old mortals, it's time for you to get a better view of things. I hand you over to our own Tower of Knowledge, Jenny, as she takes you ever further into the EM spectrum. Just don't stand on her shoulders. She'll only moan about it. I'm not sure you want to stand on my shoulders anyway. I'm only five foot four. (laughs) (laughs) It's probably not worth the effort. So... I realised last time that the EM spectrum, it went on for quite a while. Uh, I think I got a little bit carried away. So I'm going to try and make it a bit shorter this time um, <laughs> as we explore some of the pioneering people and telescopes involved with optical astronomy. Now, if I'm honest, you could write a whole book about just optical telescopes, right? Let alone the people behind them. In fact, you can write whole books on the individuals, right? And people have done that. You can get books like about Galileo and William Herschel and stuff like that. But we're, you know, we're not going to do that here. We haven't got time for that. So we're going to take a whistle-stop tour through some of the key people involved in the development of optical astronomy from the invention of the telescope. And yes, I am fully aware that optical astronomy has been happening since, well, ever since people had eyes and dared to look at the skies. There are ancient astronomers stretching back thousands of years, even cave paintings with the moon and stars. But I've got to draw a line somewhere, so we're starting with the invention of the telescope and going from there. And if you don't like it, you can write to Boris Johnson, 10 Downing Street, Westminster, London, SW1A, 2AA. So, who did invent the telescope? Galileo, I hear you cry. But did he? Arguably... Probably not. The telescope itself was probably invented by Dutch eyeglass makers in the late 1500s. And there's no doubt that one of them held two ground pieces of glass up and realised that it made things bigger. But the first, you know, telescope, word in quotation marks, patent was submitted in 1608 by a Dutch eyeglass maker of the name Hans Lippershe, which I've probably butchered, so sorry Raoul if you're listening. The patent was strictly for a piece of equipment that could magnify objects three times. That's what the patent was for. Now that 
sounds like a telescope to me in all but name. Now, Galileo is largely credited with the invention of the telescope because he took the idea of this magnifying device with multiple lenses and made his own version that was arguably far superior with magnification capabilities of, you know, 20 plus. And he was also the first to use this magnifying object to study the night sky, which is, you know, kind of the primary definition of a telescope. A few years later, Kepler built his Keplerian telescope with a different lens arrangement and superior magnification, but the image appeared upside down. And then Christian and Constantine Huygens, again, sorry, Raoul, also helped the development of the refracting telescope. And they built some truly enormous bits of equipment, all right? One telescope they built had a diameter of 23 centimetres, all right, not too bad, but a focal length of over 65 metres. Yeah, I know, right? And then the one he used to discover Titan, so that's um, Christian Huygens, the one he used to discover Titan had a five centimetre lens, but a seven metre focal length. Like, literally, go and look at pictures of this telescope, or sketches of it anyway. Like, the two ends of the telescope were connected using a bit of string for the alignment. So you kind of had, like, the primary lens up on the end of a pole sticking out the ground and then Huygens holding on to the other end of this and just a bit of string to help him line up the lenses. Absolutely brilliant. But these refracting telescopes were plagued with issues, particularly chromatic aberration, where a lens doesn't focus all of the colours of white light to the same point, but to slightly different points. And so then you get all the colours of the rainbows kind of spread out in your image. And so this is where Sir Isaac Newton comes in and he built the first reflecting telescope in 1668. And this is where light is focused using a mirror, not a lens. And Newton made his telescope using a spherical mirror, but these are very difficult to grind into the correct shape. And a huge improvement to the reflecting telescope was made by someone called John Hadley. And he made the switch to parabolic mirrors. And these are much easier to grind and much easier to get them to provide a sharp focus. So then over the coming decades, people like Laurent Cassegrain introduced the use of new mirror shapes and Chester Moore Hall developed a new lens to help solve the chromatic aberration that was present in refracting telescopes. And then the late 1700s, early 1800s really saw the rise of gigantic telescopes. So Caroline and William Herschel built the famous 40-foot reflecting telescope in 1785 and it's 40 foot long with a mirror that was 48 inches in diameter. And then this was superseded in 1845 by William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, who built a telescope with a 72-inch diameter mirror. And then, in 1897, the Yerkes Observatory was built, which had a 40-inch doublet lens, so two lenses. And 40 inches was really the largest that a refracting telescope could be built before just the whole system would collapse under its own weight. And with this realisation of the of the Yerkes Observatory, the 20th century um, saw bigger telescopes being built, but the focus completely switched to reflecting telescopes because they just knew they couldn't get any further with refracting ones. The Mount Wilson Telescope broke the 100-inch barrier in 1909. This was the brainchild of George Elegy Hal and George Richley. Hal was also the driving force behind the 200-inch telescope built on Palomar Mountain in California in 1947. But by the 40s, thoughts of telescopes had turned to not bigger, 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 but up, up, up. Lyman Spitzer dreamed of launching a telescope into space to enable studies that were simply not possible on the ground. He wrote a report which led to the first imaging kit being launched on a balloon in the 1950s. And incredibly, his report actually led to the Hubble Space Telescope being launched in the 90s. So the last 50 years have led to really incredible developments in optical astronomy. We've got segmented mirrors enabling structures on scales, you know, that could only be dreamt of before. We've got interferometry where telescopes are placed metres apart and then they work together as one giant telescope. We've got adaptive optics which peel back the shaky atmosphere. And we've even seen a return to refractive elements with arrays of camera lenses capturing the most diffuse astronomical light. All of this from one guy who was pissing about with glasses instead of doing his job. (laughs) 
And now it's time for questions and answers. And this one is from our good friend Peter Johnson at uh, NASCO Fournet um, on Twitter. Do you think we will see human space exploration beyond Mars in our, well, yours, I'm old, lifetime? What do we think, guys? I'm going to say it's going to depend on how successful Elon Musk is with his Starship, because I think if it's start, if the, if he uses this to, well, he's, get, he's got funding now to be able to develop it as a uh, NASA vehicle for uh, as a as a lander vehicle for for the moon. If that works and and Musk's ambition to get out to Mars come off and it doesn't kill people on the way, so that you know. You, that that proves the the ground and there's a lot of ifs in this um then i think that the next natural step will be although he's talking about flotillas going off to mars to colonize mars i think you know there's just going to be too much excitement to um to not try and send people even further out whether it's to the asteroid belt initially um or whether it's yeah. onto uh, one of the jovian moons i just can't see musk not doing that when there's an opportunity but it, I, there's a lot of ifs in that, and there's got to be a lot of successes. I think. I think this is. Yeah, I think this is going to be driven by economics, not science, at this stage. Uh, yeah. Because mm. scientifically, we can explore the further reaches of the the solar system probably more more efficiently at the moment, robotically, than we can with humans. Certainly, a lot cheaper. Mm-hmm. In in terms of why would you go beyond Mars? Well, actually, the the, the asteroid belt's the obvious target. And that is probably you're looking at mining and resource extraction rather than human scientific exploration because, in a way, you can do what you want to do scientifically with an asteroid, mostly with robots. That's what, the thing. What... Like, I think going beyond Mars is so much harder and like you yeah, say, like yeah, the indeed. asteroid belt yeah. being the obvious next target for mining, but you'd send robots to mine. You wouldn't send people. People are shit at mining. <laughs> Possibly. Well, yeah, but it's 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 because it's a it'd be a more dangerous operation that requires perhaps um but, you know, sort of intervention and, and people making on the spot decisions that you, you couldn't necessarily make from the sort of distances between you know where you've got um, such a, a kind of lag in the response time over over radio that you'd you'd probably need people to be closer. You wouldn't necessarily need people to actually physically be doing the mining, but in the way that we've been trialing people operating rovers from orbit from the space station on Earth, and you know, with the, with a view to be doing that on the Moon and Mars, things like that, that you wouldn't need need to send a human down to the surface all the time, but a human would be nearby in order to drive a rover more successfully and faster because they're just overhead. Rather than but then I guess half you could do away. that. Could you not do that from Mars? Possibly, Would the yeah. Delay but from Mars be too the delay, long. Still, delay from Mars is going to be too long, isn't it? I mean, you know, mm. you, if your ship's on the other side of the asteroid belt, it's going to be, you know, that's true. Well over an hour. So, but I just I think mean, yeah. you're looking going at to Saturn, could, Jupiter. Oh, I think, I think that's, it's just beyond. Yeah, that's, the journeys are too long. I mean, it would literally be people would be sacrificing their entire life to make a journey to Jupiter. Or but Saturn. people would volunteer for it. There will be people yeah, that will volunteer it. I just don't think it'll it's happen. worth it, though. It'll happen. It'll no, it'll no happen. you don't. But there will be people that will. Yeah. yeah, but in our lifetime, I don't think it'll be enough. I can see. I, we'll we'll go to Mars in our lifetime. I'm pretty certain. I mean, yeah, I'm in my forties we'll now. Mars. I expect to see in the next forty or so years that we'll have gone to Mars. I'm always certain of that. Will we go beyond? Possibly. If the economics is there and the drive is there for for people to get resource extraction, things like that, from the asteroid belt, then they will do it. Um, and I think that would be the driver. Do you know what, though? Oh, I feel like if they're going to try and go to the outer solar system, I think the goal would be to leave the solar system. Yeah, oh, that's very long term. I think that they would no. just skip over Jupiter and Saturn and, and you know, all, all of that and just, you know... the the next leap for me would be it would be Mars mining stuff from the asteroid belt in order to build whatever you need to build, build it on Mars, and then launch from Mars to leave the solar system. No, I don't think so. Don't think so. I it's too big a leap. Um, that that's that's like saying I don't know, you know, Europeans going to you know the Isles the Isles of Scilly and the the, the Canary Islands, and then suddenly leaping across to you know Australia. 
it, it's without stopping it anywhere in between. I don't, I don't think that'll happen. It's, that's far too big a leap. I don't know. Yeah, I think even if there were uh, in-orbit refueling points that were put there for for spacecraft, uh, you'd still be looking at a minimum of, of 10 years to be able to get out of the solar system, even if you just kept getting more and more fuel on board so yeah, you can keep yeah. accelerating faster and faster. Um, and and sending you're certainly not going to be sending people out there because I, how are you going to get them back? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, um, I, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if Elon has in the back of his mind after Mars, if assuming he does Mars, one of the moons of of Jupiter, because he's he he breaks that economic mold that it is. He thinks along the lines of if I can, I should do, especially if. Yeah. It's beyond what anyone else would consider. Yeah, I don't know. I yeah. just think you know. By the time we get to thinking going beyond Mars, everything is just going to be so much more advanced in terms of like what we can send out there with probes and stuff like that. Mm. I just don't know. I don't know what what sending people to the moons of like Jupiter and Saturn would really gain us over. Over what you can just get from a probe and stuff like that. And well, I, feel I think like... Saturn's a push too far. Jupiter might even be, but I just mm. can, I just can't see Musk stopping at any point. You know, unless unless he dies or his company goes bust or his he starts killing too many people in his rockets, I just can't see him stopping anywhere because he will always be wanting to push further because he's just a driven person like that. Mm. Yeah, mm. I can see asteroid belt. I can't see beyond asteroid belt. In our lifetime, mm. at least, because that's what mm. the question was, right? In our lifetime, I think if we're talking planets or moons of the gas giants, it's centuries. Mm. Yeah, you could be right. I seriously think because it's just so hard to come back into the solar system, you know. John, I, I, I was just going to chip in with, um, yeah, the asteroid belt. Mars, you can do in eighteen months. Dawn took three and three quarter years to get to the asteroid belt, and that didn't stop. Yeah. Like, if you're going to go to an asteroid and stop, you're going to take more than four years to get there. The shit that's going to go wrong in a four-year there and four-year back, just to step foot on it and then turn around and come back, yeah. that's mm. a decade at least. And yeah, You'll get there a lot faster than that, though, with on-orbit refueling. Yeah. Because I... you, you, send, you send refueling pods out to, to a Mars orbit, you send it out to a lunar orbit so that you just keep taking on board more fuel. Um, and then you can just keep going faster and faster and faster. Now, of course, you've still got to have some more to be able to slow down again when you get there. Mm. Um, but um, um, but you know, this is this is stuff that uh, NASA's even been considering, uh, even despite you know the stuff that Musk was saying. And Musk has even said, well, two three years ago when he was first discussing Starship, um, he he was saying, you know, this is the sort of stuff for exploring the the. He's he's saying it's not just for the Moon and Mars. This will be able to get you anywhere in the solar system. Now his light is just to fill the whole thing up with fuel, so you've got a massive rocket that you can send anywhere in the solar system robotically um, without people on board. But then, when he gets a bit bored of that, mm. he's got plenty of volunteers. I don't think there's any astronaut that wouldn't say, "Yeah, I've probably got a ten percent chance of getting out to um, to Europa and coming back alive." But I'm going to take that chance because. It's history books, and I'm a test pilot, and it's the most exciting mission that humans have ever been on. They're, they're different yeah. people towards, you know, they they accept the risk. Mm-hmm. Well, there we are, as the grasping hand of fate grabs the chicken of destiny and wrings its neck. We have reached the inevitable and messy end of this carbuncle on the pimple of the arse of the universe. Did you enjoy it? I hope you did. If you didn't, I don't care. <laughs> well, I care. So you can at least send your emails and tweets in to me and I, you know, I'll read them. <laughs> so yeah, don't forget to email us uh, questions points to talk about, moaning at us because you don't like something, telling us how much you enjoy something, whatever. It's the show at awesomeastronomy.com and then you can tweet the Martians and me at at awesomeastropod 
And don't forget to watch the launch of the Perseverance rover and its helicopter drone to Mars on NASA TV from the 30th of July. The launch window runs from the 22nd, but we know it won't launch until the 30th at the very earliest. But the launch window doesn't close now until the 15th of August for a Mars landing on the 18th of February 2021, which we'll actually be able to watch in HD this time rather than an animated representation of the sky crane. And make sure in the next week or so, certainly running up to the 23rd of July you get out and go and see Comet Neowise go and see the comet above the northern horizon go and see the comet you'll regret it if you don't you'll, 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 you'll hate yourself for the rest of your life um, and you don't want that no Do so it. shut it you lot <laughs> so until next time it's goodbye from Cydonia Base Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.